First, I'd like to thank the organizers and in particular Bo for the invitation to come here. I keep telling everyone it's my first time to Stockholm, but when I arrived at the entrance of the museum, I could swear I've been here before, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk today um, about um, Grayling. I've been working with Grayling for over 25 years and um, to introduce, uh, one might ask, why did you start working with Grayling? Well, to be honest, I was interested in trout and salmon, <laughs> and uh, that's what I wanted to do, and I started to research them 25, 30 years ago, and quickly realized I was one of 10 or 20 or 30,000 other people working with trout and salmon, and um, I decided to find a niche for myself, and that was Grayling. So I'm going to talk a little bit about grayling. What are they? Because I'm not sure that everyone's so um, familiar with grayling. I'm going to talk about their species diversity and the distributions of these species, a little bit about phylogeography and biogeography, and a last few comments on the conservation and future research. Oop, I was supposed to click along there as I talked. <laughs> Great. So, who are we, coming from the grayling uh, perspective? Grayling belong to the family Salmonidae, and so-called Salmonid fishes are widely distributed uh, across north temperate, boreal, and arctic uh, regions. And um, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Atlantic salmon and brown trout because you've either worked with them or you've eaten them or you've gone fishing for them or you've seen pictures of them jumping over waterfalls in the case of the salmon. Um, and for people more familiar with North America, you also are familiar with salmon and trout, although other species such as the sockeye salmon or the rainbow trout and here we have, um, the first note here is that salmon and trout come from the same genus, same group of salmonid fishes, the genus Salmo, but one is a trout and one is a salmon. And here you have salmon on Carincus and trout on Carincus. So you have salmon and trout coming from a different genus here. So you can see immediately that the common names of these fishes are not aligned with the scientific names and the relationships between them. So the words salmon and trout uh, have popular meanings, but it's a little more confusing from a scientific perspective. And so when we look at the tree of salmon and fishes, the so-called phylogenetic tree, and this is not based on a data set, this is kind of a composite of more or less kind of a schematic, I would say, uh, morphological information, genetic information. I kind of just drew this by hand, so this is not a scientific result. But at the beginning of the tree, um, we have our first split into, uh, and this, whether or not Timulos both said at the beginning they had the first split, this could very well be, we're not very clear here about where, where this is, so there could indeed be the first split, but I just threw it in. Uh, this way, and at the beginning we have three groups or three genres of fishes that we can collectively group together and simply call them white fishes. Um, then we have our, our grayling genus here, um, and then we have another group of fishes which I've worked with all three of these, huco, brachymistex, and parahuco. Um, we can call them popularly Taimen and, and Lenok. Many people in Europe and North America are not familiar with these fishes at all because they're primarily distributed in Asia, except for Huko Huko, which is in Central Europe, but I won't talk much about them. This fish, except to say that uh, this Parahuko, or the Japanese Taimen, was always associated with this genus, but now based on genetic information, and actually if you look hard enough into the morphological data, you would realize that this never should have been associated with them, and it's actually more closely related to uh, Salmo. And then you have our trout and salmon, which are not really related to each other uh, closely, as I had said before. Um, and both trout and both salmon can be found in these groups. And then you have um, char, which you'll hear a talk about uh, later 
today. And you might notice how, I'm going to come back to this a bit, how beautiful grayling are, right? <laughs> and char are beautiful too, but not, not quite as beautiful as grayling. So that's my... <laughs> so, so, okay. So when we think about salmonid fishes, um, and we think about their common ancestor, um, we know now that they evolved, uh, the group evolved about 80 to 90 million years ago. This is a, a pretty good guesstimate, I would say. And that, like any family of fishes, they share some common traits. And among the most obvious external common trait for all salmonid fishes is the adipose fin, this small fleshy fin between the dorsal fin and the tail. And all salmonid fishes, including grayling, have this adipose fin, and it's quite a, I don't think it's a 100% unique character among all fishes, but it's unique for anything that's closely related to um, salmonid uh, fishes, okay? And thinking about this common ancestor again, um, we know that uh, something extra special about salmonid fishes, and that includes grayling, is that there's this common ancestor uh, was a so-called polyploid. That is, instead of two sets of chromosomes, a diploid organism like us, um, the original ancestors to salmonid uh, uh, fishes had four sets of chromosomes, meaning they had four copies of every gene. And polyploidy, or a, a genome duplication, has happened many... It's not, it's not a unique thing. It's happened many times in the evolution of plants and animals. And it's considered by many to be a major force promoting the evolution of biodiversity throughout the tree of life. And a little schematic of this, a little dip, uh, a bit complicated, is that the salmonids are thought to be a so-called auto tetraploid, which means that um, it did not, they did not evolve through the hybridization of two completely different species, which sometimes happens with polyploids, but rather something happened with one species. And there's one of two scenarios where some mechanism led to the duplication of the entire genome, or um, actually a more common mechanism is that during some cross, one chromosome was made uh, dysfunctional and there was first a triploid and then it crossed with a diploid and you wound up having a tetraploid. And what makes this interesting for any plant or animal is that you have suddenly extra copies of genes. And what does that mean? Well, that means that um, the functions of a gene or uh, the normal functions of the gene, can continue while another copy of the gene is free to evolve. And this is, a, this is why it's considered so important in, in evolution of the tree of life. Because a lot about evolution, we think about the possibilities. Why can't, we, why can't humans evolve, uh, evolve to have eight legs or whatever? Um, we wouldn't want that, would we? But... Um, a, lot of, a lot of things constrain evolution. A lot of things hold evolution back. But when you have genes that are free to evolve because their copies are doing what they're supposed to do, then you have some more possibilities for very novel traits to evolve. Okay, so who are grayling? Um, who are we? The first question, we belong to the family Salmonidae. We have an adipose fin, among, among many other unique traits. There are some bones, as I was discussing with uh, Bo just before, in the, in the head and the vomer, that are also diagnostic for uh, Salmonid fishes. They have a polyploid ancestry. And I didn't talk about where do they live. They live in cold lakes and rivers throughout Eurasia. Uh, and parts of North America. They reproduce in the springtime, they lay eggs in shallow gravel, mostly over flowing water, to give a few ecological um, points about grayling. <clears throat> now getting to their uh, distributions and diversity. Here is a map of uh, the putative species of grayling. 
We might have up to 15 species, uh, maybe a few less, maybe a few more. <clears throat> there we're still researching this. But the most widespread uh, grayling is, of course, the Arctic grayling, and it's found from the uh, eastern borders of Europe clear across Siberia and the Arctic coast and uh, across the Arctic and North America with a population, an isolated population down in Montana. They previously were even more widely distributed and there's an uh, extinct species that was in the Great Lakes uh, region. They're trying to restore the range of grayling there, but I don't think they, it's like restoring the woolly mammoth. It's extinct, but they're bringing grayling back there. And then we have the European grayling, uh, which is distributed right from the edge. Actually, there's a little hybrid zone between Arctic and, and European grayling, extending throughout Europe, um, out onto uh, the Loire drainage in, in France, down to Montenegro, and, uh, and in the Ad Adriatic and northern Italy and, and Slovenia here as well. Um, and that's it. They don't extend south to Pyrenees. They're not in, in Italy and they're not in the, the southern Balkans. The range here is limited by the Danube, Danube River system. And just to throw in another species for a minute, a widely spread species which I was involved in first describing the so-called Baikalena grayling that's throughout uh, central um, Siberia. I have a rather small uh, bodied species um, with very distinct characteristics, which I'll discuss in a minute again. Next up, um, I point out that the concentration of diversity of graylings is actually found in, in far eastern Asia, in the Amur River drainage, which is here blown up a bit, where we have a number of species um, found either together in sympatry or right next to each other. One is the Amur uh, grayling, another is an endemic species in one river system of the Amur, the Berea grayling, um, and another is the lower Amur grayling, and a fourth species is the yellow spotted grayling, which we started out calling the orange spot, and I don't remember myself why it became the yellow spotted. <laughs> but anyway, there's four species of grayling all from this one small relative. It's small. I mean, it's uh, about as big as continental Europe. But um, some of these species, it's very, very unique because up to three of these species live in the same rivers. Okay? And in fact, this yellow spotted grayling and this um, lower Amur grayling can be found swimming right next to each other. And when you examine them genetically, they're four million years apart and they don't hybridize. So it's very fascinating. Okay, and then another little hotspot of diversity is in Central Asia, um, around uh, Mongolia and the Altai mountain river systems. And here you have the endemic Kovsgol grayling found in one small Lake Kovskol Lake in the upper Selenga River in Mongolia. Um, you have the upper Ennessee grayling, which I started, I was involved in the description of this species, and we wanted to call it the gold-tailed grayling until three people told, uh, showed us pictures of some other grayling with gold tails in some population. So we named it the upper Ennessee grayling, a very restricted uh, distribution in the upper Ennessee River here in Mongolia and, and a small part of uh, Russia. And we have the very infamous Mongolian grayling, which is the, by far the largest species of grayling. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Okay. Uh -huh. I cut that off. That wasn't very good. Um, I've... Uh, have you seen these pictures now and, and drawn a little bit of attention to these um, dorsal fins? And these are, um, well, these are not all males, but um, this is a female, but um, they're quite unique for each species. It's very difficult to quantify 
these kinds of differences. And we tried to come up with systems to do it, but we were never able to. You never have enough photographs or enough ways of measuring these things. So we can't quantify them, but um, uh, the Russian ichthyologists that I worked with over the years uh, would draw pictures of these things and pretty much be able to identify these species just by looking at them. I wasn't convinced at first, and step by step, I became convinced that actually these species have very specific dorsal fin patterns, like this Baikal Lena grayling has these rows of red spots, and this Amur grayling always has this row of blue spots and a red edged here, and um, this yellow spotted grayling always has this orange spot back here, etc. So um, these colors are are quite um, quite pronounced and very different, and they become more accentuated during the spawning period, and especially between species that live in sympatry. So, uh-huh, I'm cut off here again. And what I have not mentioned so far, this is a little bit underwater, is that these colors on the dorsal fin, but also these colors on, on um, pectoral and pelvic fins, fluoresce underwater. Grayling have a lot of fluorescence. Now that's not luminescence, so they're not generating light. It's a very specific reflectance. It's very striking, very beautiful, and certainly for the fish themselves underwater, it must serve a, a, a purpose in species or mate identification. Okay. Um, sexual dimorphism is also rather prominent, and here we have four species, and here's always the female on top and the male below, <clears throat> and you can see quite striking uh, color differences. The, the males are normally darker. The dorsal fin, which is also colorful and large in the females, is larger and more colorful in the males, and um, this is the case um, throughout the genus for most of the species, not all of them. And that's also interesting to ask, well, why is this so common for most of the grayling, but not all? And now we come back to our uh, Mongolian grayling, if for no other reason to show another stolen picture from the internet. Here we have um, um, this large-bodied, large-jawed, perseverous Mongolian grayling that lives in these oligotrophic lakes in western Mongolia. And interestingly, in these lakes there lives sometimes a little fish, but uh, it can grow rather large, the Altai osmin. And this fish has a dorsal spine, a very stiff spine on it, and there's not a lot else living in these lakes to eat. And so one could imagine, it's a little bit of an evolutionary story, that this um, Mongolian grayling evolved to take advantage of this prey fish, which has a stiff spine on it, and so you need a big mouth and a strong set of jaws to eat it. Originally, uh, it was thought that this was the primitive or oldest form of grayling on Earth, and it turns out not to be the case at all. It comes out in the middle of the phylogeny of grayling, and so this large, rather unique form evolved rather rapidly. And it's further interesting that this fish I showed you before, the Kovskull grayling, which is the other grayling that's rather unique. It's a very dark uh, bodied, um, you can't see here, but it has uh, a very high number of gill rakers, which is not typical for grayling. And so morphologically, it's very unique that both of these unique grayling um, live in lakes and live in Mongolia. You might think, oh, there must be a reason for that. Well, not really. They're not closely related, and there's nothing special phylogenetically about these fish. They've just evolved rapidly to, um, to take advantage of very unique niches in these lakes, which is not uncommon for some honored fishes. You're going to hear a talk later about char, which I'm sure will go into this. But it is unique for grayling. Okay, and interestingly, both of these fish, it's not so well uh, investigated, but we have 
uh, done a lot of work with a Mongolian grayling. We wanted to do more, but the pandemic got in the way. Um, there's subpopulations of this fish living in little rivers of the lakes that we can't tell the genetic difference between this one and they have a normal shaped mouth and a normal shaped jaw. Very typical annoying thing with some groups of fishes like salmonids. But as I was discussing with Bo just before, most grayling species come out rather nice, so to say, for a taxonomist. They look morphologically, you can identify them, genetically you can identify them, and they don't hybridize so much. But um, for these two, we have these typical problems. And this is a reflection, in my view, of rapid evolution. For these two fish, They've evolved rather rapidly to take care, to take advantage of a specific ecological niche and elsewhere in the grayling world that hasn't been necessary. And here we have, I haven't talked about genetics yet, but, but a lot of my work has surrounded uh, on doing phylogenetic or population genetic analysis with all kinds of um, genetic techniques. And um, this publication is based on a so-called mitogenome analysis, which means instead of taking, like we did for many years, just one gene of the mitochondrial genome, which is a circular molecule, completely independent of nuclear DNA, swimming around in the, not quite swimming around, but in the cytoplasm of the cell, we sequence the entire mitochondrial genome, and it gives us a high-resolution phylogeny. And what this analysis uh, did is laid upon a biogeographic technique to try to draw inferences about where grayling first evolved and how they colonized at least Eurasia. And our best guess is that uh, grayling evolved in Far Eastern Asia, probably in the Amur River drainage, if not in the surrounding areas. They then spread to uh, the northern Arctic river systems, including then North America, and, uh, and then to Central Asia. And here in this publication, we have this hypothesis of did they colonize Europe from the north, or did they colonize Europe from the south? But we think we now have the answer to that in the next analysis. And this is another tree. Now we've moved on from this mitochondrial uh, genome analysis. Bo wanted me to talk maybe more about this, and I decided to make the talk a little bit less technical. But what we've done now is we've moved on because of the technological advantage, advantages uh, or advances in sequencing, along with decreasing costs. We can now... Uh, either sequence entire genomes, but for my work that still wouldn't have been, um, uh, it wouldn't have been good because we wanted to look at hundreds of samples. So what we do is we use a technique called DDRAD sequencing. What that means is the genome gets chopped up into thousands and thousands of little pieces, and these little pieces get sequenced and we identify little variable sites in each of these sequences. So instead of having one gene or, or a few markers, we now have thousands of genetic markers spread out throughout the genome, which should provide a much more robust phylogeny, uh, among other things. And we did this, and this is a synopsis. Um, we've done this now for 800 samples, including some samples that Bo has shared with us from the museum here. Um, from a very unique place. And this is just a sub-analysis of that data set, um, explaining and without going into the details of the picture, we've, we've done this biogeographic analysis uh, again, and it comes out pretty clear that Europe has uh, been first colonized from a southern route, which is rather uh, fascinating, and it's much further back in time than we thought, probably uh, deep into the Pliocene. So we often think about a lot of species diversity in Europe as being a product of the glaciations coming and going and coming and going. But it turns out more and more and more, and it's not just with grayling, that we realize a lot of our species diversity is actually rooted in pre-ice ages which is uh, something we're still trying to grasp 
uh, with. Another thing that you'll, you'll hear a talk later today where someone will talk about the Adriatic grayling from the nuclear DNA with this new method of looking all around the genome with limited samples. Uh, a talk at the end of the day will go into more details with this perhaps. Um, the Adriatic grayling don't look like they're so old or ancient as we thought they were. Um, it's probably a much more complex story than that. And they're more related to Danubian grayling. But it's what the first split we have with grayling is actually these Loire and Rhone fish in far western Europe. And we think what happened is that the grayling came this southern route during the Pliocene and reached all the way to France um, through the Danube and the Rhone and the Rhine River, etc. And we have a, a new paper being submitted on this uh, topic trying to explain these, these colonization routes. Okay, so this more robust genome-wide phylogeny we're working on. It's lost my sound. Okay, that's back. Um, we're working on that also for North America and the rest of Asia. The analysis is not yet done. Um, supports this colonization of of Europe, and this uh, and these few interesting points about the Adriatic grayling and. Uh, the Loire grayling being actually an old split of European grayling. The Loire grayling, grayling has in the meantime been described as a species and the Adriatic grayling has been so resurrected as a species that was once described in the 1800s, but you'll hear more about that later, I think. Okay, and a final outlook, just a few comments on uh, conservation uh, of grayling. Um, so there are north temperate fish, and, and they're in many, many, many populations throughout the Arctic, um, some of the species that are distributed there. And for the most part, these species are not uh, endangered at all, and they're doing rather well. Where we have our problems is along the southern ranges of the grayling, namely with the Adriatic grayling that I mentioned, um, which is highly endangered, and I wonder, I haven't gotten to talk to Nesh yet about this, I wonder if it's on the, technically speaking, on the brink of extinction. Um, we can talk about that. They exist, but they're heavily hybridized with exotic grayling, and this is due to stock management and stocking of foreign graylings into these waters. And the Loire grayling are suffering as well, um, due to climate change. The rivers are warming in France. They had a terrible drought this year again, and uh, grayling are, are dying there. That's their biggest problem. In Mongolia, these wonderful, spectacular Mongolian grayling, uh, these environments just 5, 10, 20 years ago were rather pristine, but there's been a lot of uh, new tourism and, and scientific, I say, under quotes, expeditions and sport fishing ex expeditions in, in Mongolia. And these systems are very sensitive, and so they're being exploited. And I fear there's um, uh, a lot to do to try to protect these, these species. European grayling up here in Scandinavia, they're fine. As you move down uh, to the south, where some rivers are starting to warm and where you have a lot of hydropower expansion anyway and other uh, anthropogenic effects in the rivers, we're losing a lot of populations. So again, it's the southern populations all along, all along the range throughout the world that are suffering. The northern ones are doing rather fine. And I think I'm gonna uh, wrap up the talk. Oh, I didn't mention what are we doing in the future. There's a lot going on. Um, future research in grayling. The genome has been sequenced. That helps us a lot. And um, I would have had my PhD student um, uh, researching these Mongolian grayling in more detail if the pandemic had not gotten in the way. It was disrupted in the middle of his work and we had to switch um, topics. But a fascinating thing for me is what stops these grayling that are living in the same rivers from hybridizing with each other because it's very common for salmonid fishes to hybridize and you get all these 
messes, messy situations where it's very hard to tell species apart. And for the most part, with a few exceptions, grayling are not like that. So there must be something preventing these species from hybridizing when they come into contact. We think it might have a lot to do with mate choice and these spectacular colorations and fluorescent colors of the fins. But they also have a very high number of chromosome arms. And chromosome um, variability in Salmonids is a, it's not very well researched, but um, they're not stable. Each species and each genera has a different number of chromosomes, and maybe there's something going on there where grayling that hybridize have different numbers of chromosomes, and so they're infertile. So maybe there is something at the genomic level preventing them from hybridizing. So those are areas that we'd like to look into in a little more detail in the future. Okay? And with that then, I'm open for asking, for taking questions. <coughs> Need a better picture there for the question. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for that presentation, yep. Steve. First, yeah. I just would like to thank <laughs> you that you gave the audience a very, very nice introduction to Salmonid for and the, uh, the basic <laughs> phylogeny, yep. common names, scientific names. And apparently, my uh, phylogenetic knowledge wasn't fully up to date. I thought that Timalus was rather stuck to the bottom of the tree. But, uh, I think the Coragonus and the Timulus are both there. Okay, yeah. they're both there. Yeah. But now I'm not going to stand here <laughs> and uh, just discuss with you. Do we have any questions from the audience? Please, go ahead. I have a microphone here that we can pass. Yep. Okay, there we have one. Uh, let's see if this... <coughs> Hello. Uh, Är det en röda knappen, Micke? Kan kan jag checka det, please? Ja, <laughs> yeah. okej. Okay. And now sterilize it? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I wonder if you see any signs of, of this uh, ecotype, ecomorph formation that we see in, in whitefish and Arctic char. Right, that's a, that's a good question, and, and, and we see that with the, exactly with those um, two species. We see that only with, um, with these two species, and, 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 and it's rather amazing, and it's rather dramatic um, here that we have a whole range of mouth shapes and, and jaw shapes and growth forms, and genetically they're extremely extremely closely related, if not undistinguishable, and sometimes within hundreds of meters with each other. So, but it's not really, there's no advanced research, it's, it's, it's a remote area, that's part of what we were trying to do when the pandemic hit. You've got to go to Western Mongolia and spend some time there to look into that. And the other is this Cubs goal uh, grayling. That's been a little bit better researched um, by uh, um, a, a group in, in, in the United States has come to Mongolia and they've set up a summer camp on this lake for several years in a row. And there's definitely at least two feeding forms there, um, one more pelagic and, and, and one more um, benthic. And that's been identified and, and uh and there might be, might even be a third feeding form. And you would think with this vast area of distribution across Siberia, like with chars and like with whitefishes, that you'd have hundreds of those. And we don't find it up until now. Now that doesn't mean they're not maybe a few more, but I don't think it's widespread in grayling. And that's rather interesting. Why not? Yeah. Okay, we have a question up there, Thomas, from our paleozoological department here at the museum. Please go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> maybe I missed it. So the, the arrival in Europe is in, in the Pliocene estimated, uh, and I understood that it's a rather young group anyway. So what is your guess for the yeah, oldest occurrence or first occurrence in, in Asia then? I um, mean, how old is the group in Asia? Yes. Yes. Um, 
not a whole not a whole lot older maybe a few maybe a few million years older than that but probably so uh, uh, th this this analysis is still being done we have a similar data set with um, with 600 samples from from Asia and this biogeographic analysis uh, has not yet been done but it looks to be about the Miocene Pliocene uh, uh, border the transition in in that time but this is a rather rough rough guesses but um, we don't think it's considerably older uh, than the European colonization so you have some initial focal point of, uh, of, of evolution of the group and these were very dynamic times with um, these vast riverway systems changing um, rather dynamically throughout Siberia. That's a fascinating topic in and of itself, all these massive floods and things that have happened across the Siberian rivers. I'm, I'm fascinated with this. So I think that the group spread rather rapidly. So I would guess one to two million years older than the colonization of, of Europe, not more. See? Um, we do have fossils, and we have a fossil in Turkey, for instance, that's seven and a half million years old. And we're a little bit skeptical of that. And when you look into it and talk to the people, it's based on an otolith. Now, I'm not a fossil guy, so I don't know how certain we can be about a, a single otolith. Um, with the Siberian fossil record, we're unfamiliar with that. And at the moment, my... Connections as were better previously with, with Russian ichthyologists than they are right now um, for obvious reasons. But I'll be honest, my, my student and I discussed this and we feel that we're poorly informed about the potential literature of fossil records in, in Russia and we would need to start to um, reach out to some other people in Russia that I have not until now had contact with to, to dig into the Russian literature about potential fossil records in Russia. Yeah, so that's a, a weak spot in our research. Thank you so much for a very interesting um, okay, talk. There you are. <laughs> um, I have two bi biogeographical questions. So the first one is about Asia. The development there, you were just describing some of it, but I was thinking of the deglaciation or the glaciation there. Do you know, I'm, I'm not familiar with it, um, so do you know at, at what age the uh, ice was retracting? Mm -hmm. So that's one right. question, sorry if I yeah. may add another. So in, in Europe, I can see that there are some blank spots in the biogeographic map. So I was mm -hmm. just wondering uh, the migration route from the green area to, to Austria, sorry. Uh, is that due to non-explored areas, or what's I don't the know me, what you mean by blank, black spots. Uh, there's a, in a blank spot on your biogeographic map. Where there's like a that? white area there. Uh, um, that's a bit twisted. I'm a little bit. Yeah, because okay. Um, it looks a little exaggerated to me. The map is so small. To be honest, my, in my memory, um, there's not that vast a region without, but, it, but there is a region without the um, European grayling, and then there's the Arctic... No, what is that? I was thinking more of the one from the Caspian Sea to Austria, what happened, if you... If you know. To be honest, I'm a little confused by this little mini map, and I think I'm just going to just declare ignorance and say I don't understand that this is this is a submitted manuscript. No, this is this is not submitted yet. This is in work, and this is the uh, a graph that the PhD student just gave to me. And as you point out, there's something there that looks a little strange to me. <laughs> There, there is no vast area in Europe that has doesn't have grayling there. Yeah, so I'm sorry about that. To your original question, I could give a whole hour-long talk about glaciation in, in Siberia. It's a fascinating topic. Um, it used to be very quickly that Europeans would think, uh, you know, there, there was an old-fashioned view that most of Siberia was too dry and that glaciers never reached most of, of Siberia. Then there was... Um, 
one rather eccentric, crazy uh, Russian glaciologist, um, Mikhail Graswold, who came up with these wild theories that bas basically every thought, everyone thought he was taking drugs or something because he just painted these maps with glaciers surrounding all of Asia, even down the eastern seaboard, and, and, and he had these arrows with glaciers just moving across the landscape. And everyone thought he was crazy. Um, and then as, as the, the research technology advanced, um, some of his wild theories started to receive more attention. And um, now we're somewhere in the middle. Nobody's accepted all of his views of glaciers being all around Siberia, but they've accepted them up into um, the, the mouth of the Lena Delta. That would be the uh, eastern extension of glaciation that's more or less been accepted. Beyond that, it's still rather speculative, but there's been some new work by a German group that claims there were glaciers east of the Lena, but they were out in the ocean, and they find scar traces on the bottom of the ocean of them. And in Central Asia, where I had that other hot spot of diversity, I've already published quite a bit about these massive floods. So we have closely related species that are separated by mountain chains and different drainages and their sister species. And we say, well, how did that happen? And then you dig into the, the, the most recent literature and you see these uh, paleo floods of massive dimensions that have broken through uh, th with ice dams and paleo floods. And the, the literature there is quite ripe. There's some really great new work being done. Uh, like I said, there's a German group, but also by a lot of Russian um, geologists and glaciologists. And I, I think part of the reason is, is the, to be a little cynical, the money connected with uh, oil and gas and mineral explanation, exploration allows for geologists to do, in Russia, to do a lot more than ichthyologists can do. And so there's a little bit of money there, and, and so there's been some top Russian scientists digging into these things in the last 20 years. And there's some fantastic new publications about that. All of these ice dams and massive floods and uh, glaciation or glacial, glaciation type um, uh, building in Central Asia uh, around the Altai Mountains, for example. So this is an exciting new area of research. Okay. Are there any? Yes, there are for other questions. We love this. We love this. Um, I also would like to say thank you, thank you. Stephen, me as a lay person. When it comes to fish, I find that the most fascinating. They're beautiful, aren't they? Yeah. They're, yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> um, well, I'm not a grayling expert, but I think the grayling is doing rather well in Sweden. And, uh, there are no big threats. And what's a little bit fascinating with grayling in Sweden is that we have them in Lake Vettern, and we also have them along the the coast of the Botnian Sea. So we have some special populations in Sweden too. Ah, and, uh, um, I forgot to mention that as opposed to a lot of not all, but most salmonid fishes, we consider grayling to be strictly fresh water, except for this one population um, which is living in low salinity. I don't know exactly what the salinity is. Uh, the Bothnian Bay, uh, up in the absolutely northernmost parts of Baltic Sea. And if I understand correct, I think they spawn along, right, the, um, right. They along even the shore. They even there spawn might be there. Uh, people that can correct me. Okay, ah, it's okay. a poster on the... <laughs> There's a poster. Ah, so perfect. that is um, the, one of the more unique populations of grayling in the world. It's the only one we know of that's living in at least some level of salinity. But that also helps guide us with these biogeographic questions because we know as opposed to salmon and, and char that they could not colonize across uh, salt water. So, but this one population in the Bothinian Bay is, is of high interest in that regard, yes. Okay, Steve, before right. we let you off the hook, I will give you some gifts from oh, wow. the Fish Place <laughs> Consortium. You will have lunch ticket if okay. you haven't got it already. But then there are a few other... I only need the lunch. So <laughs> no, no, no. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. <laughs> Big applause for Steve. Okay.